most of you know that this week is the five-year anniversary of my accident, of the explosion on May 2nd. I was waking up five years ago today, five days after from what basically was a medically induced, com medically induced coma. It wasn't really a coma, but they, they had me so drugged that I don't remember the first five days. And I was just praising God. Lord, I am amazed. I am amazed by you. By how marvelous you are, how wide, how deep his love is for us. But I think I'm amazed because over the past five years, I've had to deal with a lot of disappointments and discouragements through, through that accident. And, and I want to ask you guys that today. Have you ever felt discouraged or disappointed? Did something not go the way you had planned? Have you ever got passed up for that raise that you wanted at work? Or maybe some of you are disappointed in, in the church. More specifically, maybe of you or some, of, some of you are disappointed in me or the other Pastor Joe. Maybe we didn't live up to your expectations. And then again, some of you may just be disappointed in yourself. You feel stuck. Maybe you feel unworthy because of some secret sin that you just can't seem to get past. Today, I believe the message that God has given us is how to deal with our disappointments. How to deal with them before they become discouragements. And uh, we're gonna be spending a lot of time today in John chapter 21. But I wanna be looking specifically at a God sighting that I believe happens more frequently than, we'll, than we really notice but in today's story specifically, we're gonna be looking at how Jesus not only shows up in the midst of disappointment, but how God can use that disappointment to draw us closer to him and to redeem our situations and even our faulty identities. So in John 21, if you look at the book of the Gospel of John, there's a, there's a, there's a prologue that he starts it off with. If you look at 21, in the, in the passage specifically that Joe read last week, it seemed like John was gonna end the story in, in, in chapter 20, but then he goes on and, and, and writes more. So it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a, a postscript, a PS. Like, I have something else I wanna share with you. Now, some people, I, I read a lot this week, some people have argued whether or not this is actually John writing. I'm gonna submit to you that it is, in fact, John writing, because every time he refers to himself, he refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And that's how Jesus wrote about him, or John wrote about himself all the time. It feels very Jonathan writing. It feels like exactly like how he would write it. And it is a postscript, kind of like a PS. Listen to this story. There's something in this story for you. So we're going to start off John 21, verses 1 through 5. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. And it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, James and John, and two other disciples were together. Going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, well, we'll go with you. So they went out, got onto the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, have you any fish? No, they answered. We're going to stop there for a minute. I find it funny. The text doesn't specifically give a reason for Peter saying, I'm going to go out fishing. But if we think about Peter's story, and about what had happened to him the days before, we could conjecture a bunch of reasons that we think it is. He could have been just bored while waiting for Jesus to show up, because Jesus said, you wait by the Sea of Galilee, Sea of Tiberias, until I come. He could have just been bored while waiting for him to show up. He could have just been feeling nostalgic, you know, over the old days, how he used to go out fishing, days gone by, catching fish, cleaning fish. Those are the good days when he didn't have to really worry about much of anything else except for cleaning out and mending fish nets. But I want to submit to you, I think the reason that Peter decided to go fishing that night was he was just a little bit disappointed. Disappointed in himself and their situation. Yeah, he had seen Jesus 
raised from the grave and alive, but it just wasn't the same. Jesus wasn't there. And while they were waiting for him to show up, they didn't see him. He had tried this whole disciple thing, fishing for men, and it just didn't go the way he thought it was supposed to go. Started becoming hard, especially as people started blaming the disciples, questioning them, where's this body? You guys must have stolen him, stolen him. I think it got a little bit hard for, for, for Peter. And I believe he was still really feeling guilty for, for denying the Lord three times. And, and we can do that. We, we, let our, we let our guilt draw us back into old things. So I want, to, I want you to turn with me to Matthew 26, 31 through 35, where we, where we read this. Then Jesus told them, this very night, you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. This is where Jesus is saying, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna meet you in Galilee. Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all of the other disciples said the same. I think this scene was replaying in Peter's head that night when they got to the sea and they saw the fishing boats. He just, man, it'd be so much easier if I went back to just fishing. How many of us are like that? Feel bad about our situation? Feel just disappointed and we aren't necessarily where we want to be. Disappointed that a particular event or ministry didn't go the way we, we had planned. Maybe we're just plain disappointed. So we go ahead and we turn back to the things that we've always done. Because they're easy, because they're familiar. You know, we tend to romanticize the past. All of us do it. Every generation is, is guilty of this. We romanticize the past. Man, it was better back then. The good old, it'll never be as good as it was in the good old days. I can say this about when I went to school. Man, school is so much different than it was today. We're only talking 20 years ago, right? Now, some of you that are a little bit more aged than I might say, man, it'll never be the same like it was back when I was in school. Those are the good days. I wanna submit to you that every kid that goes through the good old days when they get older, they have the good old days to go back to, right? We romanticize the past. We forget the bad things sometimes. Every one of us are guilty of doing it because we think if we can just go back there to the way things were, oh, it'll be good again. Things we won't have to struggle like we are today. And I think that's exactly what Peter was doing that night. He saw the boat, he saw the nets, he's like, man, I just want to go back to being a fisherman. And the thing about disappointment and discouragement is it's very contagious. You can feel it, you can feel it. When you walk into a room, somebody's already feeling discouraged or disappointed, it's really easy to catch it. It's like a cold. And once you catch it, you start feeling discouraged and then you pass that on to somebody else. And you all start wishing you were back in the good old days. So the, the other disciples are like, you know what, let's just all go. Let's all go fishing. We're gonna hop in this boat and we're gonna fish. And it's not like they weren't skilled at their job, right? But they fish all night long. That night they caught nothing. I don't know about you, but if after an hour of fishing, if I haven't caught anything, I'm about ready to give up. Two hours, see ya. I don't even, I, like, I like fishing, but I like catching more. I like hunting. But if I'm honest with myself, I like the byproduct of hunting more. That night, I think, I think God was a little bit, I think he was laughing at them as they're out there on the boat, really. They're trying to just fish all night in their own strength. And they're all, I can just imagine the scene where they are getting even more and more discouraged. 
over not catching anything. Man, this is supposed to be easier, right? How many of us go back to doing something the way we used to do it, thinking that it's just gonna be easier? Because when we go back to something the way, that we, the way things we used to be and the way we used to do them, we're familiar with it. We don't have to work as hard to plan. We don't have to work as hard to, to prepare. But when we go back there, we don't find the same enjoyment or fulfillment in what we used to do as we did then. I wanna submit to you three C's for combating discouragement. And the first one is this, it's calling. In verses five through eight, and first off, yes, if we don't want to let our, discourage, our disappointments become discouragement, we need to be looking for God's sightings in every situation. If we want to stop a disappointment from becoming discouragement, from discouraging us to do, do it again, then we need to recognize where Jesus is right in the moment. It's imperative. And he does that through calling. Verse five in John 21, he said, <clears throat> he called out to them. He says, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish for them, they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. I, I love Peter. He always just jumps in. He goes for it. It doesn't matter whether it's Jesus is getting arrested and he just pulls out a sword and chops the guard's ear off or if Jesus is walking on the water and he just like, Lord, if that's you, call me out. I'm gonna jump in. I'm gonna walk on water with you. Like the guy is just, he's not ashamed to just go for it, right? In that moment, he looks and, 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 and John recognizes that it's Jesus first. Jesus calls out, guys, guys, have you caught anything? He actually says children. He uses the term children. It's a term of endearment. He goes, children, have you, have you caught anything? Well, after fishing all night, I'm sure their answer was not just no. It was like, no. <laughs> no, we have not caught anything. <laughs> Are you serious? This guy's gonna tell me where to throw this net? I, I, does, does he know better than me? So, but they do it. They listen. The one thing that the disciples do very well is they listen. So they cast their net on the opposite side of the boat. And when they reel in the fish, it's not like the fish weren't there all night. The fish were there. God was just keeping them away from their nets. And when, when they threw down their net, they gathered this large number of fish. And Peter and John, they, once, once, once John notices that it's Jesus, Peter's like, oh, that's the Lord. I gotta go see him. I need him. And he jumps off the boat. Now about 100 yards to the shore, you can imagine the water's not too deep, but his, he's thinking, I can outrun this boat especially if they're carrying the fish and I can be the first one there. I get the picture of him and John running to the tomb. And of course, John wins because he's the disciple whom Jesus loved and he likes to brag. <laughs> but I love this picture, Jesus calling out to his disciples. He called out to them. He challenged them. In their midst of their disappointment, Jesus said, hey, Try it this way. See, our disappointments in life may just be God's appointment for you to rely on Jesus. If there's anything you get this morning, realize this. Our disappointments in life may just be God's appointment for you to rely more on Jesus. They had relied all night on their own power, their own understanding of fishing. And it wasn't until Christ called out and said, try this. It wasn't until they started listening to the voice of their savior that the fruit showed up. I believe Jesus was reminding each of these disciples about the work that they were really supposed to be about. And there's really, a, I think, a twofold purpose for the reason that he showed up this very last miracle that he performed before he ascended into heaven. This is 
the earthly Jesus that walked the earth. This is his last miracle. Now we all know that Jesus is still up to miracles today through the power and the work of his Holy Spirit. But the last miracle he performed as a man on earth is this. I think the twofold reason is this. Number one is he wanted to remind them where their help camp comes from. In John 15, five, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. The story is a perfect example about apart from him, they could do nothing. They tried all night long and they didn't catch a single fish. When Jesus called out, when he showed up, the net was full. Apart from him, you can do nothing. But with him, when you remain in him, you will bear much fruit. And then he wanted to remind them of their first calling. This story in in John is very, very similar to the first calling of Jesus' disciples in Luke chapter five. When we read this, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Genereset, the people were crowded around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat there, sat down, taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night. We haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come out and help them. And when they came, they filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord, I, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had just taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up from shore, left everything and followed him. I think Jesus was reminding them of their first calling. The calling that in their disappointment, they started to back away from going out to fish for people, or fish for fish, not for people. When they were out there, they started getting even more disappointed, more discouraged, because they caught nothing. But when Jesus shows up, and they catch this multitude of fish, I can just imagine Peter's, what's going through his mind. The picture that, that's Jesus, that's my Lord, I need to be right here with him. I need to be listening to him. And, and, and he just dives in to go after him. See, we, we need to recognize the Lord's calling. We need to listen to him in our lives because that's when we will see fruit. When we remain in him, we will see fruit. We can go back to the past. We can try things like we've always done them. And when they're unproductive and unfruitful because we're doing them in our own power and we're not listening to the Lord, that's when we need to stop and listen for his calling. Allow him to give the direction in our lives. Because we'll no longer find satisfaction in the way we used to do things unless the Lord is calling us to do them. Does that make sense? And then our hearts will fill with passion to pursue him. Once he calls out, our hearts will, will just burn within us with this passion, this renewed sense of the calling that he has given us and, and we'll just dive in. I preached a few weeks ago on on courage to face your fears and dive in. When Jesus shows up, he gives you courage to just go for it. I think the second C to combat courage is the next part of this story, and that's communion. To combat disappointments. First off, we need to recognize Jesus calling into our lives, into our situations, but then he calls us into communion. In verse nine, it says, when they had landed, they saw a fire burning with coals there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Interesting note, there's already fish on this fire that Jesus had prepared. There's already bread ready. 
But now Jesus is saying, bring some of those fish that you just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, about 153 of them. That's a lot of fish. And they weren't just little fish. They were large fish. Think they were, he was, Jesus was trying not, to sh, not necessarily to show off, but just say, hey, when you listen, I'll provide. I'll take care of you. It's funny that they counted them. <laughs> They're fishermen. But even so, with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? For they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. You know, isn't fellowship around a table just amazing? I grew up having family dinners almost every night. And it was at these family dinners where you sat down and you rehashed your day. You talked about school. You talked about boys and girls. And you talked about life. But you shared life. And it's amazing when you fellowship in church, the same idea with a family. When you're, when you're sharing around that table and you're, you're talking, you're having an intimate gathering where you're just sharing life. It's a great place to connect. And I believe it's not only, this, this dinner table is not only where like jokes are made and friendships are formed. These old stories are told and retold a hundred times. But it's in these moments, especially when you share them with Jesus, they have some of the most intimate times with him. It's some of the times when you read the scriptures that he had the most intimate times with his followers. And there are a few places in this life that each of us can connect and refocus our lives on Christ than in communion. The communion table is one of those places. It's one of those places that I love to just refocus on who Christ is. And that's what he did right there in that moment with his disciples. He said, listen, I'm inviting you to the table. It's already prepared, but I want you to bring some of your fish. It's funny that he said, bring your fish because he's the one that provided for him anyways, right? But he's offering an invitation to join him in this meal, but he's offering them the chance to help serve and host this meal. It's a great picture of what we're supposed to do as a church. We're not only supposed to come to the communion table to experience Christ himself, but we're supposed to bring things to the table that we can then share with others. I want to take a moment right now for you guys to prepare your hearts for the elders to come forward because we're gonna take communion during the message today as a chance to focus on Christ right now. So if the elders and their wives could come forward, I want you guys to just, in your minds, in your hearts, to examine. The Apostle Paul says this. He said, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and they drink of the cup. It is at this table where Christ himself becomes present. It is at this table where he says, this is my body, which is broken for you, for your healing. This is the blood of the new covenant given for the remission of your sins. So examine your hearts. Take this moment to think about Jesus meeting with his disciples, you. Take this moment to focus on him, to recenter your life on him. And then when we come back, we'll finish the last point of the message. So let me pray for communion. Father God, I ask as we come to meet with you today, Lord, I pray that you will remind us that this table is open for anyone that, that wants to experience your presence. Lord, let us not take lightly the, the broken body that you had, the, what you had to go through in order to provide for our healing. Let us not take lightly all the blood that you shed so that we could have complete access to the throne room of God. All of our sin forgiven. Father, in this moment, let us focus on you. Lord Jesus, I thank you 
for the opportunity to come to your table this morning. And I pray this in Jesus' name. I think it's an amazing example of exactly what Jesus was trying to get across. Listen, I want to spend time with you. I want to commune with you. I want to have time where we can just sit around the table, where you can focus on me, on the important thing. At the communion table, we can push aside our disappointments, our discouragements. And we could focus on the one who never disappointed us and never will disappoint you. He invites you into this table, into this space where you can just focus on him. And that's exactly what he did with his disciples. He brought them in. He said, come on, let's have breakfast. Let it, let's eat breakfast together right now. And then he does the most amazing thing to restore Simon. And I think the last thing that, 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 that the Lord wants you to hear out of this story this morning is in order to really battle disappointments, to combat them, he gives you a calling. He gives you this communion, but he also gives you a commission, a job to do. And in order to do that job, you have to be in a right relationship with him. See, at the Last Supper, Jesus called out to Simon. He said, listen, in Luke 22, verse 31, it says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you, all of you, as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And that when you have turned back, you will strengthen your brothers. In the story that we have today, in John 21, verse 15 says this. He says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Well, yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. When you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. But then he said to him, follow me. Maybe you're at the point where spending just a little bit of time with Jesus in communion helps you redirect your life and refocus on him. But it doesn't battle the discouragement that you're facing. And you need to spend some time, some honest, good, hard time with Jesus to where he can restore your past. Something might have happened that you need to focus on Jesus and Jesus can restore it. That's exactly what he did with here with Peter. Because each and every one of us will never be effective in ministry, in our job, in our mission, unless we're serving out of a place that is overflow, a place where, where God has healed your brokenness, where God has given you a new outlook. And what he did with Peter in this moment was he restored him. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. I don't know if you know anything about the process of sifting wheat, but it's not a very fun process. It's really hard. And that's exactly what he did. <laughs> Simon went through this, this thing where he just, he denied the Lord three times. And I'm sure it crushed him every time that he went through that. Every time he said, no, I do not know that man. It crushed him a little bit. And it didn't dawn on him until that third time when the rooster crowed that he had really screwed up. But Jesus came, 
met him where he was in this moment and he redeemed him. So I wanna encourage you, if you need more than just communion, to go after it. Because God has given you a mission. God gave Peter a mission. He said, listen, after you have went through this, after you have come through the other side, I want you to strengthen your brothers. In Matthew 10, seven through eight, Jesus sends out the 12 and he said to them, as you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Don't miss that. Freely you have received, freely give. These guys were able to do the work of the ministry because they had freely received everything that they needed from Jesus first. If you're gonna do the mission that God wants you to do, the calling that he has for you, need to receive everything that you need from him first and then go out. That's when you can face disappointments and discouragement is after you have had that quality time with the Lord and then pursued him with all that you have. And you can go after, go hard after following him or strengthen your brothers or whatever his calling is on your life. Maybe he gave you the calling back in Luke 5 like he did with them. No longer will you be fishers of fish, but I'm gonna make you fishers of men. Maybe he wants to rekindle your calling this morning. But spend the quality time that you need with him freely you have received and then freely you can give. So maybe you found yourself going back to the old ways of doing things. Maybe you just needed to spend a little bit of time refocusing on him in communion this morning. Or maybe you have a lot more work to do. (laughs) Maybe Jesus needs to spend some time with you this morning like he did with Peter to restore you. If that's the case, don't be afraid to seek out help. Our elders, Joe and I, we would love to help you experience Christ however you need to be, have him meet with you. Freely you have received and then freely give. Listen, the, the calling that he has on each and every one of us is we are to go to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded them. That's Jesus is calling us to go and make disciples. That's our calling. That's our mission. But we're not able to do that unless we're serving out of overflow. So I want to pray for you this morning. Will you stand with me? Father God, I thank you for this story. I thank you for this message that when we are facing disappointments or discouragement, Lord, you call out to us in those moments. You remind us that we need to be spending time with you. Father, because it's when we spend time with you that you give us new direction. And, and Father, when we remain in you, that's when, our, well, that's when we bear much fruit. Father, so many of us, even I am so guilty of this sometimes, we operate out of our own strength because it is easy to do that. It's hard to take the time that we need to spend time with you and minister from that place rather than the place of just knowing that we got it. Lord, I'm sick of, of going back to the way we used to do things just because it worked, maybe it worked then. Father, I pray for a new direction, a new calling, Lord, I pray that you will tell us what to do and when to do it. Father, I want to see you work in amazing ways here in Countersport. Father, set each of our hearts on fire so that we just, once we recognize that you are calling out to us, we do like Peter did. We just dive in so that we can run hard after you. And Father God, I pray that as we spend time in communion with you, Lord, that you restore our relationship. And Father, restore the calling that you have called each and every one of us to so that we can minister out of that place of effectiveness, out of that place where you are, your Holy Spirit is working through us. So Holy Spirit, I pray that you have free rule and reign 
over each of us this morning. Lord God, I pray that you will bless each and every person in this place. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine according to the power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.